you know, many of the people here on this panel and, and who've spoken today have written about uh, the problems that we've had by not being able to reproduce one another's research using the antibodies that are available. So this panel in part will talk about why that is and, and how IPI as part of a community that is already a robust one, how can we add our uh, uh, contribution in an appropriate way to that goal? And if you think about it, for those of you perhaps like me in the audience that is more of a newcomer to the field, if you think about the evolution from polyclonal antibodies, from classic immunization approaches, to the development of monoclonal antibodies, uh, and the ability to have immortalized uh, uh, singular clonal antibodies available. Now, in the age of recombinant antibodies, uh, and as we've heard today from several speakers, more uh, exotic constructs, uh, scaffolds that are or are not based on antibodies, there's lots of opportunity here. There's been a slow evolution, but much of the evolution, I would argue, has been about specificity and utility, perhaps, but not with specific and intense focus on reproducibility and accessibility, cheapness and ease of, of development. Uh, so with that as a preamble, I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel, please, and, and get started. Uh, so I'm going to go from my extreme right uh, and across. So uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Megan Rigo. Megan is the director of antibodies at AdGene. And as I mentioned earlier, AdGene is a nonprofit biorepository providing plasmids and protein tools to researchers worldwide. Megan oversees Adgen's recombinant antibody production and quality control platform, and she is a key contact in the relationship between Adgen and IPI. Thanks for having me. Next to Megan, we have Rob Myers. Rob is the director of the antibody platform at IPI. Uh, he's my close colleague and has been my, my personal mentor in my journey of learning the antibody business. Uh, Rob was a former group leader at EMBL and has been working intensely over the last couple of years to scaling up the Institute's platform for distribute and development of synthetic antibodies. Uh, Rob's particularly interested in uh, applications of uh, uh, research uh, antibody reagents in, in the neuroscience space. Next uh, down the row is uh, Alan Edwards. Uh, many of you know that Alan founded and leads the Structural Genomics Consortium, a public-private partnership generating research tools and knowledge to support basic science and early stage drug development. He's a professor and the Temerary Nexus Chair of Health Innovation and Technology at the University of Toronto. You've already been introduced to Andres Pluchthun, uh, but just a reminder that uh, Andres is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Zurich. Next is Eric Anderson. Eric is uh, co-founder and uh, uh, CEO of uh, uh, Alloy Therapeutics uh, and has uh, been uh, founder and, and seminal leader of many uh, companies in the antibody space, including Atomab, Compass Therapeutics, Elector, Arsenis, Avitai. Uh, Eric is a bioengineer, a man of my own heart, uh, an entrepreneur who's launched seven now venture-backed companies. And then last but not least, Andrew Cruz, professor of uh, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School. 
Andrew works on uh, uh, studies PCRs and other transmembrane proteins in human health and disease. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the meeting today, Andrew was uh, uh, working very closely with Tim Springer in the, the original formulation uh, and development of, of IPI as an idea and as a reality. So given in that role, Andrew, I'm going to put you on the spot as one of the founders. Um, and if you can give us a short and personal view about the problem, the challenge that you and Tim were trying to solve when you cooked up this thing. <laughs> okay, is, is this one on? Yeah, okay, so we'll do that. Um, yeah, so, so first of all, I, I just would like to say thanks for the opportunity to, to be a part of this panel and to you know, share some of my views about antibodies. I think it's really been an exciting morning so far and a, a pleasure to participate. Um, I can just hold on to this. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we'll improvise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I can say, you know, one of the things that really, um, you know, for me was uh, an inspiration trying to get involved with antibody discovery, antibody engineering, was experiences in, in my own field of GPCR research, where um, antibodies are both incredibly useful, valuable tools for solving many of the problems we're interested in, things like um, understanding conformational change, um, things like rationally modulating receptors to achieve particular research goals. Um, but at the same time, in many cases, for many problems we're interested in, the right antibodies don't exist. And either there's simply nothing at all, or um, reagents that exist and that are published and sometimes even widely used um, are not as reliable as they should be. They have off-target binding activity, they have lower affinity than claimed, um, they don't work in certain formats. Um, they, they may work in uh, Western blot, but not in flow. Um, and often there's simply not the level of information you need to, um, to know what you can do with a given antibody. And so um, that was really uh, one of the motivating factors for me to start getting involved in antibody research in my own academic lab, and then also getting involved um, with IPI with Tim um, and trying to make these sorts of tools more broadly available to let people address the research questions that they otherwise could not. Andres, maybe you could uh, uh, pick uh, th this discussion from here. You know, you're, you're one of the co-authors of the, the papers that I was describing a few minutes ago. Yeah, absolutely. Can, is this on now? No. <laughs> well, we have a hand mic. Now, now it may be. Okay, I, I can, can Andreas really, use the hand mic? I okay. cannot really judge, but I, I guess I can speak loudly. Okay. 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 Here you go. Okay, that's even... Even better. Okay, so so yeah, so we wrote a, a paper together with Andrew Bradbury and I think 110 co-signatories, <laughs> simply stating the obvious, which means that about half of the antibodies that are being sold shamelessly don't work. Uh, they either don't recognize what they claim at all, or they recognize it plus many other things. And uh, I think sort of for, for me as a you know, as a biochemist, biophysical biochemist, if you will, it's surprising how docile the scientific community is. There's a thing, yeah, that's the way it is. Sometimes they don't work. <laughs> uh, I come from, from a completely different background where this is not acceptable, <laughs> where a, a, a chemical structure should really be what it says on the structure. And so I think it's, it's time to clean up. And we, we didn't uh, write anything else in this article but stating the problem. And, uh, and of course, uh, this has, uh, has been cited many, many times as if this was an unusual discovery. But I think we just were stating what everybody already knew, but uh, some people were afraid to say. We were not afraid to say this. Of course, we didn't make only friends this way. But um, I think this is, this is a discussion for uh, the subsequent questions. Was that your chemical background or your German background? <laughs> maybe so attentive. <laughs> uh, maybe both. Um, no, I think sort of to, to make it a, uh, an analogy, when, when I got into molecular biology, I think it was just the time where it was completely normal that the whole plasmid is sequenced and that you actually know what you're working with. And for me, this is sort of how I was brought into this, and I think it should, everything should be like that. 
And uh, it is to me still surprising that there's a certain part of the scientific community who can live without that. It's frustrating. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Alan, I'm going to ask you to, to carry this thread along uh, because you know, you've led uh, one major public-private effort to try to fill in that gap, uh, and yet uh, uh, just providing more antibodies is not enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I know how to do it, guys. Um, yeah, so, I mean, my history in this started when I was a graduate student and injecting bunnies, right? We purify a protein, mix it with froines, go back and forth with the syringe, inject the bunny, xylene on the ear, getting some bleeds, and it was a real pain. And then Babco happened. I don't know if that's the first I was aware of a commercial, so I thought, hallelujah, we don't have to do this anymore. And then over the course of the next 10 years, then 20 years, on the pissed off ometer, I kept getting higher and higher and higher because these reagents weren't working. So we thought uh, a collection of us, maybe 2012, solution. Our organization had purified thousands of human proteins, their antigens. Why don't we, like white knights, save the day? We'll make recombinant antibodies to each and every one of them, put them out there, and there was no CRISPR then, so we couldn't do the experiment we do now, which is wild type versus CRISPR knockout. We used them to immunoprecipitate from lysates, and then we did mass spectrometry on the immunoprecipitates to unquestionably show the antigen was there because the triptych you know, peptides were there. And we made 1,100 and something antibodies to 150 proteins, published it in 2015, put it in the public domain. We thought, mic drop, boom, I'm done. I walk <laughs> away, I was gonna wave to my fans. <laughs> and then nobody uses them, right? It, they don't get much better than this. This is a folded antigen. It pulls out its antigen from a crude lysate. The, it's the, the top, uh, most abundant species there. They're great recombinant antibodies, and no one uses them. And that got me thinking, right? There are 3 million antibodies out there, probably on the market already. I created another 1,000, 3 million and 1,000. And to the community, it's the noise, it's in the noise, because there's no generally accepted quality criteria for antibodies. They don't rank them, they look for where was, was it published before, I can use it because I'll get my paper. How cheap is it? What's the least expensive? I'll buy it. And so I think this is a super cool problem of sort of scientific sociology, because even if you build beautiful reagents, the community won't necessarily use them. And that was my unfortunate 20 year lesson until we started this new thing I'll talk about later. Thank you very much. So, Eric, you know, uh, you've been working sort of at the interface between antibodies as research tools and as therapeutics. So, um, uh, as you think about both sides of the coin here, you know, how has the, the challenge of uh, using uh, uh, research tools has complicated the development to do uh, therapeutic development. I, I mean, I love the piss off meter thing. So like, I, I feel like I tacked that out at a much younger age perhaps. So I've been a meddler. Hey. So I mean, I, don't, I was like a child when I got into this field. The, um, I think, so at Atomab, we really solved it from a different angle, which is you just go full therapeutic where there's a willingness to pay an incredible amount of money. And that is largely not accessible to most of the world. It's, it is what it is. Adam has a wonderful company um, and does a really, really great job of making human therapeutic antibodies because it just turns out that's really expensive to make an antibody. I think most folks don't appreciate how expensive that really is, just the amount of work that needs to be done in the lab, the cost of the reagents, the cost of the people. It is what it is. How do we work together as a community to bring those costs down to make it more efficient? And so you can solve it in a really expensive way, but then you can't make that accessible to everybody. And that, I felt that attention, that tension very, very acutely. Um, so how have we done that? We, um, at Alloy, more recently, uh, we reinvest all of our revenue back into innovation and access to innovation. So we're trying to drive down costs over time, um, but we're, we're threading this needle of you gotta make at least a dollar of profit. Megan and I were talking earlier, it's like, you're a nonprofit that actually has, like, breaks even. Yeah. You're like better than 98% of the biotech companies out there. <laughs> you're the nonprofit, right? So uh, Jack's Lab did a good job of this, like the IPI being funded and having been sustainable, I think is really important. So I think the challenge is, 
how does something like the IPA charge for what it does appropriately, services and the reagents at, at the right level? You know, can we charge Pfizer a little more so we can make it free for academics and find a way to, to break even or better? Um, I think investments in shared infrastructure and, and sharing our research and making them accessible to folks more broadly and easily um, is really important uh, so that we can bring down the cost and make it more efficient. Um, because that's the only, the only way we're going to cure disease is if we work together. I mean, it's like these silos obviously don't work. And it's kind of incredible what we do as an industry and how we cooperate. Um, it's a weird industry and how much from academia all the way through to pharma with emerging biotech in the middle. Um, then you have odd organizations like the IPI that's kind of a hybrid um, in this translational focus. Uh, we need all of those folks playing the game there um, and, and trying to share as much as possible. Great. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, build on that and have us talk a few minutes about uh, uh, the fact that uh, if you're developing a therapeutic antibody, you're willing to spend millions of dollars to engineer the molecule. Uh, uh, we certainly cannot do that for, for research tools. Uh, and so, uh, Andy, I'm going to ask you to talk about some of the ideas that you and Tim had about reducing the cost of antibody discovery. And then I'm going to ask Rob and Megan to talk about the reality of trying to uh, make that a, an, an, an ongoing uh, enterprise. So if you can start. Um, yes, I, I think you know the challenge of making antibodies, antibody discovery efficient and cost effective. You know, as others have alluded to, really, you know, is this question of striking a balance, right? You can make very good antibodies, and you can do so at relatively high cost. It's an expensive process, and there's, I think, no way to totally circumvent that. Um, I've been excited for you know really since the beginning of my career about synthetic antibodies because. Um, many of the types of antigens that we're selecting against, such as human GPCRs, are so highly conserved between uh, human and mouse that immunization approaches are often not successful, um, or you don't get um, antibodies that bind to extracellular epitopes that are um, subject to um, you know, immune effects that would prevent you from getting those kinds of binders. Um, so synthetic antibody discovery to me is really appealing because I think as these technologies um, like ribosome display, phage display, yeast display um, improve and become more efficient and become more highly automated with robotics, um, the cost of running selection campaigns becomes lower. And I think it can be done, um, again, this is a challenge for the IPI, but I think it is conceivable that you could do antibody discovery in a way where you have a high standard um, for research quality reagents that doesn't need to have necessarily great pharmacokinetic properties in humans. Um, there's a lot of other things that would have to be met by a real therapeutic drug, but recognizing that for research tools, um, those may not be necessary. And so finding a way to, to thread that needle, um, and I think synthetic antibody discovery platforms have a big uh, role in that. Thank you. So Rob, uh, uh, having to, now that you, 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 you had that, uh, grabbed that baton from Tim and, uh, uh, and Andy actually had to make it happen. Some of the, tell us a little bit about some of the day-to-day the -day issues about trying to make a, an efficient platform. Sure. So first of all, I think it's very humbling to hear all these stories. I think you started Morphosis in 1992, Andreas. So this has been done many, many times over already. So uh, we are really standing on the, on the shoulders of giants, I think, here. Um, and so we're really trying to listen, first of all, and hear and, and get advice how to do this again and hopefully get buy-in from communities because I think it will take a village to really get this going. Um, so our approach is really to try this, to do this in really high throughput. So I think early on, uh, IPI recruited some amazing people that really built out automation so that we can really work in high throughput and we basically try to address this problem in sort of a systematic way by going after whole families of proteins. So the, moon, the very far reaching goal is trying to get antibodies for all the cell service receptors, human and mouse. At the moment, the technology we have, that would take me, at least me, to my retirement, whenever that might be. So, so I think there's a lot of uh, improvement in, in um, automation, automation that we still need to do. But I think we have a good start. We are basically making uh, antibodies in high throughput, and we are refining them and trying to figure out how to, to make them application-specific, because the other problem is we are not making therapeutic antibodies. 
But as a result, we need to really figure out what is a good Western blot antibody. And so that's where I think the work that Alan is doing is really important uh, with Icarus uh, to do this very systematic validation of antibodies, which are also going for particular applications. Um, and the other thing is, I think it's really uh, important that we share as much information about these antibodies. So we would like to publish the sequences uh, of these antibodies when they come in the public domain. And in that respect, I'm very grateful that Agin uh, has agreed to collaborate with us now. And we're going to start and launch, uh, hopefully, soon our first antibodies with them. Oh, thank you. Megan, uh, you know, I understand that uh, your antibody operation is, is only a year or so old. Is that correct? So if you can tell us where you saw the, the synergies between your uh, you know, much uh, you know, robust, long-lived uh, plasmid operation versus some of the new things that you're wrestling with on the antibody side, and, and what are the learnings from that that you were able to you know, quickly uh, build on? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's working great. So um, first off, I know it's been said by other people, but I should reiterate, you know, when you buy a plasmid, you get a sequence. When you buy a chemical, you get a structure. When you buy an antibody, you get a black box. You have no idea what you're using. And for that, that's really problematic for us because obviously we spent years really changing our processes so that every plasmid that comes in is complete plasmid sequence. People know what we're getting. We developed for our viral vector sequencing so people know the structure, so it, or the genomic structure, and it blows our mind that researchers are expected to spend all this money on tools and they really don't know what they're using. Um, and for us, it was really, we were really lucky. We had a great collaborator with Dr. Trimmer about a year ago who has a huge collection of recombinant antibody tools that he was willing to share with us, which really started it. And it just makes sense, you know, you have a plasmid repository, these tools are plasmid-based. Um, it was a really nice area for us to kind of go in and go down that route. Um, so we, with plasmids, we th feel like we have a very strong distribution network. We believe in open science, obviously, that's why we want to make the sequences open. We believe in transparency, so any data that you know that the tool has should be made available to people. Any limitations that you know the tool has should also be made available to people. And then equitability as well, no, no matter where you are geographically or what institution you are at, you should have access to the same tools. So a lot of our resources are, are actually spent trying to figure out how to get these tools to difficult to reach parts of the world. Um, what scientists are not being served, what communities are not being served. And we're really excited to be partnering with the IPI because they share a lot of these values with us of the openness, the transparency, and also just trying to fit in these niches where there's this huge need where people don't have tools. So we're really excited, and I think together we can really do great things and really propel and you know help these communities just do great science. Andres. Yeah, can I, can I, does this work? No, no, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's try this way. No, I, I'd like to add something to this. And of course, in the beginning, working with recombinant antibodies, we always thought that this is the way to distribute plasmids. Now, let me tell you a few anecdotes. I mean, I have to preface this with I'm working at, in my opinion, extremely good institution with fantastic colleagues, super scientists. Okay, so I got a call and said, Andreas, you've published this interesting paper with this and this antibody recombinant or this and this starpin. Can we have some? I said, of course. Um, but I, the stuff we have in the freezer is a few years old. I'll send you the plasmid. You just do a nickel NTA purification and you have it. Uh-huh. And then it became clear to me, uh, there was silence on the other side of the line. <laughs> they, they don't know how to do bacterial expression. They have never purified anything. And they said, unless we can, we can give them the purified protein, they cannot do this. And then it became clear to me that for the community we're worried about are not the protein engineers, are the ones who cannot do this. And those people really want or have been used to getting purified protein. I think this is just a reality from anecdotes that have come to my telephone. So how, do, how does the IPI think about this? How do you support at Agene, Megan? Um, how do you support it with services and solve that problem? How do you think about that? Yeah, I, 
Completely agree with you. They also don't want to make their own viral vectors, which we learned as well, which is why we also offer viral, uh, ready to use viral vectors for people. We try, we put protocols online, we make videos, we try to enable scientists to buy the plasmids and actually make it themselves. They still don't want to, which is why we also make it as protein and have it available. So you have both formats available. If they want to make it themselves, we're providing the know-how. They probably don't want to make it themselves, so they're going to spend the extra money to actually buy the purified form. Oh, Just for fun, it's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> you send them the plasmid and they're biochemists and the protocol, and then you get a phone call two weeks later, it's not working. Did you follow the protocol exactly? Yeah. Really? Well, we used TB instead of LB, <laughs> yep. and we thought 37, we usually do it at 37, not 30 like you got. <laughs> and then it's a nightmare of going back and forth. Anyway. Yeah. And in that story, it's Andreas that gets the phone call. Because yes. he was the one that said yes, and that's, <laughs> it's hard for you to feel exactly. all of those. Andy, please. Yeah, I would just add that one element of this I think that's important to consider in the long-term life of a reagent antibody is um, user support, right? It's not just sending them the protein the first time. That's obviously, you know, a prerequisite for anything that follows. But having uh, resources to allow them to troubleshoot and diagnose problems and uh, address those problems as they come up, I think is going to be really a critical component of making these reagents broadly available and really achieving their full potential. It's so hard. It's so hard to do exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Megan, maybe you could tell us a bit more about you know, how you've been able to provide technical support. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a dedicated technical support team. They're PhD level scientists and we like to hire People, you know, for proteins, we hired someone with an antibody experience. For AAV, we hired an AAV person in neuroscience. And you can tell as we launch these new streams and you start getting questions coming in, that kind of helps us to do the hires because then we know the questions that we can't answer and then we can bring in the expertise from around the field. And it also helps that I think because we're a nonprofit, people don't see us as, you know, a money grabber that we're trying to go after them. So when we go to conferences and interact with these people, they really see us as their colleagues and they really, you can tell they get a sense that we're trying to help them. Um, so if you look at customer service, it's, it's really nice because people will actually send us messages, you know, thanking us for all the help that they get. So I think just being out there, being open and just like letting the community know that we're there for them and that we really want to, we want to know what your problems are because if you are open with us, tell us what your problems are, that's when we can try to solve them or bring in the expertise to solve them. As we started to uh, uh, map out the next few years for IPI, uh, I was able to take my experience from the Jackson Laboratory where uh, the commercial side of JAX has the same kind of technical information service that is providing, because nobody wants to read the manual about the mice that somebody, they, want, they want another scientist to tell them how to use them, how to phenotype them appropriately, et cetera, how to breed them. Uh, but uh, also, the value of having uh, training programs, courses, and, and events like this one, where you can talk about the science at a deeper level and what people are doing with the tools. Uh, and so uh, I hope you'll see more and more of that from IPI and hopefully uh, in partnership with AdGene and, and, and others here. I mean, one thing that I would maybe add to that is that I think a way that you can really enhance the user experience and the utility of these reagents is to build communities of users around particular antibodies and particular tools that are being developed and connect them with one another so they can share positive and negative experiences and experimental protocols, details, and so forth. So it's hard to do in the context of a venture-backed biotech company, and we just need to do a better job of that. I mean, it's just, we just have to do a better job. We've got to figure out the business model that makes that work. So, so uh, Rob, I'm going to put you on the spot and maybe uh, share some of the ideas that we're talking about in terms of uh, fostering a community like that in the neuroscience. Uh, okay, I'll try to do one best on Alet. So, I, I, so I'm very interested in working with the neuroscience community. And I was recently approached by uh, a PI who has been working on a particular protein family for 20 years. And he relies on an antibody vial that is from 98. Um, and the hybridoma has been lost, but there is basically this one antibody that he uses, it's five milliliters. Um, and he has been using that for the last 20 years. He takes out a little bit. And he's almost at the end of that. Um, and then there are like, 
several dozen papers that use that antibody, basically, and it will be gone. So um, in that particular case, we will actually help them probably rescue it by doing mass spec and actually get that sequence out and resurrect it. But what we really want to do is give him a better tool, um, something that we absolutely can verify and, and validate and, and, and also share with everybody. And eventually, they can even, through edging, if they want to, make it themselves if they know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I like how the Michael J. Fox Foundation has done this, right? In the, in, in the way that they hand out money, and then they demand that you, you got to agree that it'll become a reagent. And, but then they also put support behind it they have scientists there that are helping in this. They, they've done that really, really well. I'm curious what other institutions have done a good job like they have. I mean, IPI is, is doing it as well, right? So it's going to be great. The uh, uh, CHDI, the Huntington's disease group, uh, has a very similar operating model. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, you, you, you started talking earlier about uh, uh, some of the the, the activities that you've been supporting now uh, in terms of Icaros and, and, and the importance of not just providing a high quality reagent, but having a, a deep dossier of uh, characterization. So. Okay, yeah, so the story's continuing now. 2015, it's not working as we planned. The three million antibodies out there, the hypothesis is there's some pretty good, darn good ones out there. Why don't we find them? There's 200 people making new antibodies because it's quite easy to get funding to make something new and flashy. It's, it's really hard to get funding to characterize the existing repertoire. So we formed a partnership with all the antibody companies. We agreed on a standard operating procedure. They donate antibodies to us and we're a charity and we just say what we'll do is we'll take a wild type cell, we'll make a CRISPR knockout so we have a beautiful control. This has all the proteins, this has all the same proteins minus the one. And then we do an agreed protocol for Western blots, for immunofluorescence, uh, for immunoprecipitation side by side with the, let's say the 10 to 15 preferably renewable monoclonal or recombinant antibodies on the market. And we just go antigen after antigen after antigen. And as you guys know, this ABCAM's anti recombinant antibody will be great for Western blot, single band on a gel, it disappears in the knockout. Maybe it's Thermo's antibody that works immunofluorescence. Sometimes it's a mix and match. Um, but I think that's the way to go. So when we're talking about making antibodies, you know, there's three million. You don't want to just make it 300 million and 50,000 more uncharacterized antibodies for, to confuse the community. Um, and so that's what we've elected to do. You know, and we thought we'd, we found that 40% of the human proteins already have a recombinant, what we would say high quality antibody that exists in a catalog somewhere. Some of them have never been referenced in papers because uh, the people keep referring, well, that one was used four years ago in that paper in Nature, therefore, it'll pass the peer review process, right? And, and it may not be a good antibody. Uh, we've started to look at the first 700 antibodies we characterized. It's not 50%, but 22%, they've been used in immunofluorescence figures. 22% of the figures use an antibody where the wild type and knockout signal is the same. That's, that's sort of canvassing the literature. That's about probably what, you know, 20% of the figures of immunofluorescence likely are uh, done with, um, it's an artifact. And it, it's kind of sad. Um, now the interesting thing is the companies, once we do this experiment that they've condoned, right, they've agreed to SOP, 18% of the antibodies that we have tested have been pulled from the market by the companies. Hmm. But the professors still want them. They get phone the company. Remember that antibody took off the market? It works in my hands. Could I have it, please? No joke. That's it. That kind of scares me. Like you get the positive result you want. Welcome to our world. Yeah. <laughs> so let me uh, put a toss-up toss question out there. You know, what do you think is the sort of minimum standard that we should be trying to achieve with respect to characterize most antibodies? You know, because we're trying to figure out here at IPI, what's the right level? You know, there was some discussion early on that says we should just put it all out there. We should get them out there uh, a, 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 as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, Al, you, you are quite eloquent about uh, 
the importance of, you can't just put it out there, they won't come. I think Alan made some, some very important points, which is, of course, the, the, the key question is what else does it recognize, or does it perhaps recognize even only something else? And that, that is, of course, the core question. But I think sort of the, 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 the fundamental chance of recombinant reagents is, first of all, that they're defined. They have a sequence, they can be named, and they, they are different to, to something else and one can always refer back to. With the monoclonal antibodies as they are today, you have this additional problem, you, you don't quite know what you have. And uh, the same antibody can get different labels because one manufacturer sells to another and the same label doesn't mean that it's the same antibody because sometimes the cell line is replaced without telling the customer. So these problems can be solved. But I think um, a, a challenge, I would say, will be um, to, to actually have a business model that will eventually recover these costs of characterization. And again, um, I mean, when I, when I started Morphosis, uh, we, we uh, always thought that eventually there should be a reagent business coming out of this, but then you had in the company essentially two teams working. One, the mission was, Spare no expense, make us a picomolar antibody that doesn't cross-react with anything else but has an equal affinity to mouse and had another team to say, this is your budget, do as, <laughs> as, as, do as well as you can. And of course, this didn't go together very well. There were, shall we say, later. slight frictions in the company. <laughs> and so the, uh, the region uh, part was split off and is now part of Biorad, who are, I would say, doing a very good job in making a business out of recombinant antibodies, but as a price. The uh, margin is not outrageous, it's expensive. And so the, I think the customer currently can get the sequence, but they don't publish it. And of course, this is something else one has to consider, is if you spend the money in having done all the characterization, you want to be paid for it in some way or another. Who, uh, what, what is the position in somebody else taking your sequence now, having done no work whatsoever, and uh, selling it at, at a tenth of the price? That is, I think, part of the reason why many of previous, um, uh, enter uh, previous uh, sort of ideas of this kind uh, broke down. Yeah, so, and then in the antibody vendor market, they make a lot of the new antibodies, right? Um, it's the same as most businesses. 10% of the products generate 90% of the revenue, and a lot of the products generate nothing. And if you were to spend, let's say it costs $20,000 to do a proper characterization, and the ant most antibodies make $1,500, you're going to go out of business. And so they don't have the resources except for the high sellers, which everybody has already. And so our attempted solution was to have one sort of common characterization, and everybody contributes to that. And the quid pro quo for the companies is that uh, they can't control what data we put in the public domain. We test their antibodies side by side by side by side, put the data out there. Uh, if their antibodies are good, that's a win. They don't need to spend another dollar of marketing because it's a, you know, a third party said their antibodies selective. Yeah, it's, it, I think that's what's been the 40-year problem is the business model more than the science. Now with CRISPR, the science is easy, right? Knock it out, you've got the beautiful control. You know, it's not brain surgery, it's just the models, the financial model is a hard thing. I think this really you know, brings us back to what we started with at the beginning of what IPI can do that's really different than what's been done before, right? I mean, having a nonprofit organization that doesn't need to, um, to generate a net, net profit, but at least needs to you know, find a way to be sustainable, um, but which is sufficiently resourced thanks to, to um, philanthropy and all of the, the gifts that Tim has contributed. Um, you know, now I think we actually have an opportunity to really do this sort of thing at a scale that hasn't been practical before. And I, so what's the level of characterization? Like, what's, what's the minimal level of characterization IPI needs to do, which might be a little bit different depending on the antibody to the target of the community? Let's say, and then you put it out there and you have a quid pro quo, right? It's like, we're going to give you, we're, we're putting our stuff in, and I don't know, maybe there's a small amount of money, because depending on the lab and the startup, maybe, you know, five or $10,000 it says, and you must give me back all of your data in this format, and... You know, you'll lose some exclusivity on it, but you just got to figure that out. So how do you get leverage on that $5,000 around the data that's been contributed so you can get somebody else to spend 50 because they need the $50,000 of data they're generating and you get it back? Yeah. Leverage. 
in my experience, uh, just building a public database, a repository for shared knowledge around reagents, tools, that's not enough. Yeah. Because you can't lower the barrier enough to have people just do it altruistically. They won't. So I, I, the, the point that you're uh, uh, making, Eric, I, I think is an excellent one. You've got to give them some reasonable incentive. And, and, and we've been talking about uh, both actually giving away a modest amount of antibody, additional antibodies, like to incentivize people to tell us what they've learned about the last ones yeah. that they bought. That may or may not really work out in the long run. Um, I, uh, another uh, approach that people have taken is to offer grants to help incentivize that collaboration. I think one of the best ways is likely to be what Rob has been talking about in terms of these uh, focused workshops, focused collaborative groups around uh, specific problem areas in biology where people will make a commitment as a unit, as a team. Mm -hmm. to, you know, it, it, rather than altruistically helping the whole world and hum humanity, it, they want to help their five or ten uh, regular co-authors and colleagues well, and, like and help their particular corner of science expand. That's a, so the, to pick up on that, if IPI put out a, you know, hey, we're going to do this and it, we need $100,000 to do it, and so let us know if you're willing to put in ten grand to do that. And like, as soon as we get ten people to do it, it's a funded project and we're going to do the work. That, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry, just to pick up on that, if there was... No, I, 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 and I think that we can find uh, other public funders to help in that effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, matching funds, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Because then it puts the burden on us as companies, perhaps, or even in our more philanthropic work to say, yeah, no, this is a priority. And then we know IPI is the clearinghouse. You have a high-quality offering. We know that if you... If you made a $10,000 donation into that, you know what the quality is coming back out. I mean, as a philanthropist, it's very hard to find projects where they actually, like, your money goes to where you think it's going to go. And so, and I know the administration of that would be very hard, what, what you just suggested. But if IPI is willing to be the clearinghouse of that, you actually, you have a trusted brand. And so people and, trust you. And, and funders who have uh, a track record in developing resources for the broader community are willing to support that. So... Megan, uh, I, I wonder if, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Agene's success in getting resource grants from NIH and elsewhere. Yeah, so we're on our third year of a grant from the BRAIN Initiative, and it was to establish a neuroscience-focused collection of recombinant antibodies with Jim Trimmer. And that was very much just to create a resource for the community. Um, we're also involved in some more... Uh, targeted grants with teams within the brain community. So it seems like getting that first grant kind of opened us up to the brain initiative and the bike and community. Now that they know that they're, we're here and that we have this resource, they're coming to us for um, future projects for brain atlasing is the future projects that we're going to be involved in as well. And they're also creating antibodies in this endeavor well, as well. But the idea is and what the Brain Initiative is really pushing is that all of the tools that they're making have to be open. So the sequences have to be available, they have to go through Agene so that anybody can access them, so that once this brain map comes out, anybody who wants to do brain staining is going to be able to access these tools. So they're really not even allowing them to use antibodies that are from commercial suppliers that aren't recombinant. I have a, I think there'll be the two things that control professors are getting grants and publishing. Those are the two sort of narrow points in our lives. And parking. And if we can control, and parking, yeah. If we can, con I ride my bike. If we could control either of those two, then everything else will take care of itself. So if one can imagine coming up with some sort of target product profile of what a good antibody is, getting the community to accept that, and unless it has those qualifications, you can't publish it, you can't get your grant, the community will start to demand it, and then it'll go from there. It's going to be so hard because professors don't like to be told what to do. But 
if you could do that in my fantasy world, that would, that would sort it all out. So far the theory. Now, um, I, I can tell you that actually such initiatives have been uh, widely discussed in Switzerland to really put, put pressure on people actually from the reproducibility point of view, but also from animal welfare point of view. So, that, so there have been massive pushes. Now, what has happened actually uh, through some in, in international connection is there was a wild uh, cry from more immunology-based people who, who just wildly uh, uh, disputed that recombinant antibodies, especially of the monoclonal type, could ever do what their trusted and true polyclonal serum would be able to do. <laughs> And so, so the, the, the fear of essentially uh, prohibiting the use of uncharacterized uh, tried and true <laughs> sera um, basically quelched completely these, these initiatives. So, so that's the reality. And the reality is simply um, that there is part of the, um, the, 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 the great part of the community are not protein engineers. They're very different, they have very different backgrounds, very different expectations, very different upbringing, uh, very, very different backgrounds. And so essentially um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the Swiss science community had to tone down these, these uh, things um, because of this enormous resistance from, I would say, the immunology slash medical part of the scientific community. And the, I mean, the dirty truth is whether you're getting your antibodies from a rabbit or a mouse or a rat or a great phage library or from yeast display, you can find junk in any of those, right? So like, you, you have to be cautious in, in how you make and characterize them. I, you, Megan, can I pick up what you're saying? The, just riffing a little. Um, I don't know what the targets are in that grant, but we do antibody discovery, human therapeutic antibody discovery that's, that's expensive. We lose money on every project. Like, we lose money. And I have to actually talk to my, it's funny, one of my own scientists was like, well, I know we make money. I was like, no, no, like, literally, I'll show you my income set. We lose so much money, like, doing this work because of all the characterization. Yeah. If there was, like, a check the box, so we have external partners, big pharma companies and otherwise, and we know what targets they're doing, and we throw away most of the antibodies. Like, these are human antibodies. We do a fair amount of characterization, and we throw away most of them. If you had to check the box, and I knew which targets you were working on, and I'm like, hey, I can send these to Adgene, and I can send these to IPI, and they're going to do some characterization, and they're going to put them in their database. But it's stuff that you didn't want anyway. You know, would you would you allow us to do that? I, I don't. I mean, we're already doing the work. We don't have the money or the resources to characterize. We have no way to, to distribute characterize? it. Characterize? Like literally. I mean, we have some characters. We can share our characterization data, which is probably like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars worth of data that you oh. throw away because it's not the lead antibodies. I mean, we're open to collaborating with anybody who's willing to be open and share their data as well. I mean, we see... This is stuff they're throwing away yeah. anyway. So can if we, anyone, can we yeah. shame them into checking the if box on our contract? If throwing stuff away, then please yeah. don't. Please share it. Totally. You, don't, you don't know who could need it, you know? Yeah. Especially because criteria for what makes a good reagent antibody are, in many cases, quite different. You don't care if it's mouse-human cross-reactive for most research purposes, right? right. Whereas for a therapeutic, it, probably is very, very critical. Affinity, activity, yeah, all exactly. these things. And, they, and of course, the answer is always no. So I don't know, is it, is it shame? Is there a little bit of financial incentive for the smaller companies? I don't know. But maybe there's something there in, like, with the other antibody discovery companies to take what is being cast off that are very good antibodies, as you say, Andy, but they're just, yeah, just not the lead. A little cautious, though, right? Because you make an antibody for one application. Mm. And the, in our labs, you know, immunochemistry is going to be different from Western. It's going to be different from, yeah, so yeah. you'll need a, a range of different antibodies. So that's kind of obvious. Megan gets to say no to any trash we pass her. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, I like to say, like, it doesn't mean an antibody is bad. You have to just find an application that's good for it. There's some terrible ones, but just because it doesn't work in your Western blot doesn't make it a ad, bad antibody. It might work in an assay you just haven't tried. So. Yeah, I hate, it's really, we have to be cautious when we say work, right? Yeah, it works. Because that's always our bias. Well, that experiment worked. It's a good antibody. It's a good antibody? Yeah, it's a good one. I'll give you my, it's a good antibody. And you have no criteria, no quantitative, no pl plus or minus. <laughs> I, I strongly advocate, you know, the, the idea of a, of a knockout is, is sort of the real world application of it and how we would use it. And that, can, that kind of concept, right, can be gone through all the applications. I strongly recommend that's the baseline, right? And then, you, then, of course, in a different cell type, the proteins might be at different levels, but at least it'll get rid of the ones that recognize the exact same signal in both things. Mm -hmm. And you can get rid of a lot of trash, 
One recombinant um, thing I should say, so of the 800 antibodies we tested, it comes in buckets, polyclonals, recombinants, and monoclonals. The recombinants, by, as a fraction, are better performance. So fewer of them fail, um, and so it just blows the, you know, immunologists, that's not being fair to immunologists, but you know, the polyclonal users out of the water, because you know, one argument was, because there's multiple epitopes, polyclonals will be better in case there's a protein that masks it, yeah. Maybe, but two recombinants will be far better than that. And we're starting to see that in the data. And Al, to be clear, that's on the, the CRISPR knockout, just the, that, Correct. on that assay. Correct. On yeah, the, yeah, three, the, different, assay. the yeah, three different applications. Yeah, on average, they're performing better. It could be because they're newer and they're better characterized in the pipelines of, of the companies. It's not necessarily, but that they can't replace monoclonal, a polyclonal, sorry, is definitely not true. That's a great. That's for sure. Yeah. Al, as you talk about Icarus and, and, and using the knockouts, uh, you define a floor, and the result of that, you've been seeing the providers getting rid of 15 or 20 percent of the antibodies. 18. That, that, the, the logic there is really compelling. But now the question is, how do we go up to a next level of a set of uh, 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 widely used, uh, uh, widely applicable set of protocols for each of the different applications so that, that that at least gives you some likelihood that many scientists will use it in, in many cases. I, I don't know. It is gets a little bit complicated, you know, because at, at the very high level, it sounds simple what we just said, but then you have which fixation condition you're going to use. Yep. And then you have which cell type, because the, the signal to noise will be different each. And so we never say this is better than that. We just say this is the protocol we followed here. So I'm not so sure it could say this antibody is better than this one, but it can say that these 12 are bad and we should never use them ever again because the signal's the same in both signals. So it needs a lot more thought because it is nuance, right? Science is nuance and it's not black and white, but certainly the first approximation is what we're doing systematically, uh, and that should guide a lot of people, one would hope, anyway. Excellent. Uh, let me invite people from the audience to come up. We've got, uh, uh, we have one mic here. Uh, there used to be a mic in the other uh, aisle. Please, uh, please come up to one of the uh, floor mics, and, and we'd be happy to, to take questions. I hope so. Please. So you guys talked about having a repository sort of open source for the antibody sequences, uh, definity data, and all that. Do you think it will be valuable to have the end user um, recommendation of what worked and what didn't as a repository so that everybody else know? I, I don't know. I find comments to be worthless. but. Oh, de definitely, because I mean, let's just face it, the fact that an antibody works either in Western blot or in flow is to be expected, because one will be a denatured epitope, the other will be a folded epitope, and very few antibodies have a recognition epitope that happens to be uh, accessible to both. So that's the expected thing, uh, and so therefore um, the the, the user should be informed about this. How was it made? What was the antigen in panning? And so therefore, what's the expected result? And so therefore, I think this is an absolute uh, mandatory information that this is provided. But how is that information sort of collated? I mean, if it's just like comments on an open source website, you're going to get, you, there's no way to sift through. There has to be an editorial process by which you determine whether that's a legitimate yeah, so, so I mean, in, in, uh, in good companies, and those exist as well, there are data that support this, that either show a, a flow diagram and or a Western blot. Um, and so, so I think this is to be, this would ideally be provided. And I don't know if open source, like I don't like that term because it, like how do you fund it? How do, it's like, we need like a slightly different term. I mean, Adji, like you're not open source, but you're a nonprofit that does this. So we need like a petting zoo or something like some other analogy for how we take care of the animals there. And right. we are at Agene trying to build a data hub for people to enter their antibody data. But um, 
it would be any submission that went in would go to a curation scientist that would look through and make sure that the proper controls were there before posting anything online. Because just because it didn't work for a certain person, if they didn't have the proper controls, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And how do you motivate someone to do that? You can't get your scientists to like fill out their lab notebook. Yes, exactly. Let alone go to AdGene and like upload Yeah, the data. most difficult part is the activation energy. So we've yeah. had an AAV data hub now for over a year and just trying to get people to take the time That's and fill bad. it out and fill it out with all the details that you would need and all the nuances for your experiment is really difficult. So we're exploring ideas of maybe providing people with a DOI if they fill it out or we've tried to do gift cards. And that's really been the highest, the hardest part. We would love to have everyone submit their data, but you know, we're only getting a handful of responses. Thank you. I mean, I would point out one case where this has sort of worked historically is in the example of um, the Protein Data Bank for sharing structural biology yeah, data, yeah, which people, yeah. I think, have really embraced and which is also mandated by NIH and by journals. And so um, even if you don't want to share your data, if you want to publish a structure, you have to put your structure factors on there. or um, your electron microscopy maps, right? And so, um, you know, this kind of model, I think, can work and has worked in the past in that setting. And so thinking about ways that we might be able to emulate that could be a useful model. It's a, I mean, for the structural biologists, in there, it's a great point, but it didn't come from the NIH. It came from the community. And then the funders mandated it. And I think that's something that IPI could do if it really sort of comes out there as the open place like work with like-minded and create a community that demands it, and then you'll change the funders, and then it'll be slow. And I think you need both pieces, right? Yeah, so, the some didn't do some, it. Uh, some uh, journals have started to require um, a characterization of antibodies, and I think this is uh, totally reasonable if the antibody has been made by the authors themselves. <laughs> it can be seen as perhaps less reasonable if I buy an antibody and I am doing actually the, uh, the, the quality control for, for the vendor uh, who, who sells it also to other people. I understand I have the responsibility that this is as correct as possible what I write uh, with, with the use of the antibody in the paper. But of course, uh, this is, is not seen very well, why the end user who has actually paid money for this thing has to do the characterization such that the company can sell more of it. That is, that is a problem that I think has not reached its final state yet. So the question, one of the questions that we're wrestling with at IPI is, will the community spend a bit more for an antibody that has that validation package associated or would they prefer to cut every dollar they can on cost and get it from somebody who hasn't historically provided that level of data? You'll find both. <laughs> what works at JAX? I mean, well, how did you navigate I, that? You know, so uh, JAX generally, even for the most popular mice, asks for a premium. But it took them decades to build that trust and the reputation. They didn't start there. Uh, and I, I would love IPI and Adgene to be in the same position, but we have work to do to earn that level of trust that people will speak. They'll, they'll invest in the premium to make the ecosystem work in the way that several of you have talked about, but to make this sustainable a, a, as a healthy ecosystem. And you know when you call Jax, you're getting a talented scientist that you're having a discussion with. So there's something to the service component there, knowing you're getting a little bit to what you're saying, Megan, you're talking to a scientist. Like that feels like an important component of it, that it is staffed with scientists that can actually support or even do new services, however it's defined. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Please. Thank you for tackling this. <clears throat> uh, I think it's very important for science indeed. I, um, I think you just answered some of my question and then some how to um, include the, the actual worker in the business model. But um, my, I, I, I work for a, um, uh, an outfit that makes antibodies for research. And if you, uh, you find them in literature, if you scan the literature, you can find uh, 100 different ways to cite the same exact antibody. And so um, we've been working with RRID to have uh, one place where you can go with this ID number and know about the antibodies. Um, and the, the other side of that coin is how do you pressure journals to make um, authors include 
uh, the RRID as a descriptor um, because um, that still needs help. I think, I think this question has been, of course, raised many times also in, in previous meetings uh, uh, on this topic. Um, I don't think this has been widely uh, accepted yet, and I still think it's, it's a great idea, but it's a stepping stone. At the end of the day, it's just, it's just a code that, uh, that, describes a, that describes a black box or a white Eppendorf tube, if you will. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think what we really would need is, is, is a relationship to uh, what in chemistry would be the, the, the formula. In this case, it would be the sequence. I think this is the only thing that really relates a substance to a denominator. I, there was a dean at Dartmouth who said once, I, getting professors to do what you want, but I think it's true for biotech companies and otherwise, getting professors to do what you want is like herding cats. I can't herd cats, but I can move the cat food. And I think about that all the time. Like, so what's the funding? So if you put a, if you put a little like $5,000 bowl of cat food, and it's like, if you collaborate, you can have the cat food. It's just there. It's yours. I mean, I can't tell you what to do, but there's some cat food. It feels like there's something in there that is a bit of the answer to that question. How, how do we make people do I mean, you can't, you can't make people do things, but perhaps you can induce them through some sort of pairwise collaboration or money. Or I love gift cards. What's the level of gift cards? Does it work? The, yeah, the more you're willing to offer, the better the response. Are we talking like a hundred bucks? No, like, we're talking like 10 to 25. Oh, this is feasible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it depends how many, you know, how many inputs you want. Like they do add up, you know, as you get What if we put money. Pfizer's logo on the gift card? We can give them, it's like marketing budget for them. Oh. Make it hundred bucks. <laughs> so, I'm trying to get Pfizer to pay for this. Uh, please, we would still welcome questions from the audience, but while uh, others are, are coming up to the mic, let, let me uh, come back to something that we talked about earlier, uh, because I would love the panelists' uh, opinion on this. Uh, we have said that IPI is going to be focused on uh, uh, research use uh, tools, but uh, it is hard to find a good sustainable model just on that, and Ajin has work diligently to, to, to make it a, uh, uh, an ongoing uh, a activity. How can IPI, Agene, and other similar organizations uh, provide value for the therapeutic antibody development community, provide services, tools, and how do you take advantage of opportunities that may lead to therapeutics uh, so that some of the, the financial benefit from that can also help sustain this environment without getting pulled into just becoming another therapeutic development organization. You've been I successful think, at this. I, I think you run into a conflict of interest sooner or later because um, obviously uh, you would have to carve out um, certain reagents to a particular target um, and you would have to probably keep most of them for a long time until it's really clear what works in the animal model, perhaps even with what works preclinically. And, and the, typical, um, uh, the, the typical workflow, and many of the, in the panel know this, is to have a, uh, several candidates that are run quite far through the program until you do finally settle on the lead candidates and you give up on the others. Now, um, this can take a long time until this decision is made, and during this long time, I think it will be very hard to, um, to put the other things in the public domain. And so, could it be done um, in theory? Absolutely. But I mean, I think from, from what I've seen around me, um, this, is a, this is a conflict of interest, and I think one just has to recognize this. Um, and so therefore, I would say, of course, uh, antibodies of this nature has, um, have gone into, um, from, from academia, have gone into therapy, absolutely. But um, at some point, one will have to make a decision of patenting. And, and then, of course, you have, to, you have to cover a certain space and you have to make, at some point, the decision, what, is, what are your lead candidates? So I think it'll be, it'll be difficult to do both. 
It'll be tricky, but it's, but I really like that question because keep pushing because there's got to be a way to solve it and maybe it's economic, like, you know, it's no royalties. You, you start thinking about the simplistic economic things you can do where IPI doesn't need to make money, but any dollars that come in offsets costs that are happening. I think about paying for operational capacity. That's how we think about things at Alloy. Um, you know, when we launched our transgenic mouse, we, it came from an a, incredible source of frustration, right? My, my dad was six months away from having a shot to be on a PD-1 and he died, right, because he couldn't get on it. And so I was just pissed off. My piss off meter was high. And I was like, this is stupid. That There was a Nobel Prize in hybridomas in 1984. And here we are still jacking around with an inability to get access to a transgenic animal to make a human antibody. Phage display, I think all of the war and all the lawsuits in phage display set us back by 20 years at least in people's willingness to innovate in phage display. That's how Adamab became a company is because we were avoiding all of Andreas's patents. <laughs> and it's, why we it's literally why I had a business. It was getting around all of the, the lawsuits and trying to find freedom to operate. And it pissed me off so much that we invested in this mouse. We were building our own. And then along came a discussion with a friend who knew someone at AstraZeneca. And they had been building a mouse since 2009 to get around Regeneron. And they never commercialized it. And they were going to throw it away. And I was like, well, don't throw it away. Like, how good is it? And we pulled it out. And so the Alloy GK mouse actually came from inside Metamune AstraZeneca. And Bahija Jalal, she actually approved it. It went all the way to the top. They said, yeah, you can have it. And that, that saved us a few years of building our own mouse. And we put it on the marketplace, royalty-free, $50,000. Academics get it for free. Pfizer pays a little bit more. I keep picking on Pfizer because I love Pfizer. OK, so <laughs> let's just get them to pay for everything. The, and so I know that's true, but we had to build something that was incredibly useful and try to get it out there. And we charge for it, which I struggle with because I'd like to make it free. Because we know that saves six months or 12 months off a humanization process. And so if your antibody leads you towards you need a human antibody and you're just going to humanize it, that's off patent. A good protein engineer can do that easily. But it takes six to 12 months. It's easier to break an antibody than fix an antibody. And so what if you just have a transgenic animal and it's easy to get? So like, what's the equivalent that IPI has that might be a technology like that or something that is like sustainable? And you can charge like 50K for it and then 3,000 teams license it. And it becomes sustainable inside your model, inside your model. Great question. Please. So it, it's back a, a couple uh, ideas before. So a couple things to say to start off. One is that I've heard this conversation for over 30 years. Um, Alan and I have sat across the room in these sort of discussions um, I don't know how many times. It's not an easy step forward, but two things to say. One is what he said about this doesn't change until you change publication or funding. And so talking to this group is great, but unless you echo that to those components of our system, and you don't have to get everybody to go to begin with, you can get a couple smaller foundations, smaller operations to go. You know, I can bring it immediately back to National Cancer Institute and talk to them. Everybody thinks about this all the time, but you gotta kick butts in those two areas because if you don't do that, you will not win, one point. Second of all, what you said a moment or two ago about wanting to charge more for antibodies to the research community is a dead end. Do not do that. Um, you will fail immediately. This community will not move around those kind of um, ex expectations for, for better good. Um, you've heard Alad's stories about how you know, he provided things for free and people can't do it. At the National Cancer Institute for a decade, they had a call to the community that they would make an antibody for free to any antigen that anybody wanted. All you had to do was nominate it. And they had to stop it because the field didn't even send them names of antigens that they wanted antibodies for. So it's got to be at price, and you got to kick the sources that real the levers that really matter, because um, it's the only way you will actually move anybody. And so, um, just a, a couple words of caution, at least from my standpoint. Thank you. Anybody want to uh, react to that? I'm curious why the NCI thing didn't work. The free antibody sounds great. Well, 
Hmm. And I, I was on their SAB, and I said, you guys should do knockout controls or else you're just contributing more. Too expensive. Mm -hmm. hmm. So they, who knows if those antibodies ended up being any good. They are monoclonal, but uh, I think it's a really key problem. Right? We really have to spend the time up front. Was there an IP ownership issue maybe? Like if, if, if I'm a Harvard PI and I do this, who owns the antibodies? Is there some sort of ownership issue? I'm laughing so I don't cry. I mean, it's just, yeah. fuck, this is hard. You know, it is sad. It's really sad. But it's, I mean, but this is not, I mean, as I said, the same discussion, you know, how the first line was in 1990. You know, so we've been at this a long time trying to figure out how to make this go. And the call was exactly right. It just says, you know, well. But I do think the difference that is that companies now are making recombinants. Yeah. They are good. 40% of the human proteome is covered by one already, and that will increase even if IPI and SGC don't exist. Yeah. That number is going up. And so that's, a, that's good news. Now it's built and they don't come because nobody's using them because, so that needs to be fixed the way that we have to affect the funders and, and the publishers. Uh, so I'm kind of optimistic that we can get there. And then with this effort that these guys have started, right, you can just more robustly add more you better figure out which 60% is lacking before you start going, right? Because you don't want to repeat that. Um, in terms of the, I have an IP question that I'm not so certain because I don't do the, in the small molecule world, what we decided was with industry to declare a rather good small molecule inhibitor as an open resource, um, not pharmacologically optimized, right? And we said that's our chemical probe. We put that in the public domain. People use that molecule to do biology and then they link the target to a disease, and then competitive stuff can start. Is there an analogy in the antibody world? Um, so the idea of making an antibody, put it out there, let you know, receptor X be worked on by the community, all of a sudden it's you know, therapeutically interesting. You already have your antibodies. Can you just optimize the antibody, then create IP after that? It's, it's complicated. I think uh, the patent office has also changed uh, the way the definitions are made. And so today, uh, you can no longer simply claim an antibody to target X. That's sort of seen as a known technology, as a solved problem. You can say, this is the sequence, and I claim, let's say, 95% identity as p being part of the same invention. So I think an enormous um, uh, boost would come from the fact that those uh, institutions or companies that, that put efforts in the uh, characterization can protect that and simply say, you cannot sell my sequence for which I actually did the characterization for a tenth of the price. Now, the, the key question to be solved would be, is there something much, much cheaper than a patent that would solve the same thing. That question, again, has been discussed many times. I don't think an answer has been found, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but I think it would, be, it would be great if there could, could be something like a patent light, a trademark, something that would simply say, you cannot just take my sequence for which I've done all the characterization and, and sell it at a tenth of the price. Um, and so this is, this is sort of, you know, Re requiring some creativity of people who know something about these, uh, these legal systems. I, I like that. My question wasn't about the reagents, but let's imagine when IPI put a reagent antibody to an uh, unprecedented surface receptor in the public domain, um, had other sequences in the background. That receptor was used by a professor in Munich to find out, oh my gosh, uh, nephritis gets better. They ha then. IPI would also have the remaining antibodies, maybe different sequences. They'd know the therapeutic indication. They could just go from there. But that would be a, a firewall between the open. I don't know if that's possible. Presumably, it depends on the, to, the to sequence. Andreas's point, 20 yeah, years I think ago, someone might know. <laughs> 20 years ago, you could. Oh, sorry. Tim's well, answer. No, well, I proposed that a long time ago. You know, the uh, patent line. And, no, no. I, I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't really hear the whole context of the discussion. But I was proposing that that IPI just hold back some of the, um, some of the antibodies they made and, um, and you know, 
make, make others available for therapeutics. But coming back to the, uh, the patent issue, um, you know, copyright has been discussed, and, and there are some people who think that you might be able to copyright, um, you know, a sequence. It's debatable because copyright typically applies to uh, things that are created by humans. Um, but uh, there's no, no reason Congress, you know, U.S. Congress couldn't just enact such um, a law. And, and there would be, you know, I think good, good reasons for moving that kind of a law forward. Um, you know, I think it could be done. Um, it, because it would be, you know, I mean, it would, um, it would value uh, innovation, which is, you know, obviously what IPI is about, um, and, you know, um, and, you know, protect it against um, copycatters. So there's no reason that, you know, the sequences shouldn't be protected by some sort of a law that Congress could enact, and maybe if they did so, you know, it would stimulate other countries to do the same thing. I mean, idea. patents, patents, you know, patents have a reason for existence, and, yeah, you know, we, we could find that. That's a great idea. Other questions from the audience? How do we get that done, though? Well, people are thinking of a question. It's like 500 bucks because you have to show it's in commercial use, and it's 20 years ago you could get a patent on an antibody against a target in any antibody. And then it's 95% homology, and then we debated, is that in the H3, or is that the whole antibody? And there's a way to fudge it if it's the whole IgG. And that's been narrowed down. Um, but if you could, if you could well, do it, just as Tim suggested, the, uh, a copyright. Pat pat patenting, really patenting is an expensive process, expensive. As, as many of yeah. us know. And so therefore, for uh, uh, something that's used by, I don't know, tw 20 labs as, as Western blood reagents, there's no way to offset this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think incentives is part of the huge issue. Um, is there a way to leverage government, I guess, or whether it's through tax incentives or, I don't know, or even just collaborations amongst countries, like something at a bigger scale, because maybe something larger is what it takes to fix this kind of thing, or it's just going to be kind of that competition that we have to deal with. I, it's hard for you to change governments, but if you picked one target and you were passionate about it and it was like a disease you were interested in and you find a disease foundation and you did this around, like Michael J. Fox did this around LARC2, right? So you call up Debbie over there and there's like something in Parkinson's you're working on and like pitch it and do it and get it done once, like that's something you can do. So prove that that works and let's try to get all of Parkinson's and then let's try to get neurodegeneration and let's spread it to something else and then maybe it flows up. but. If we sit around and wait for the governments to do it, I, I don't think we're going to be happy with how long it takes us to get there. Yeah. And so we did stuff with Michael J. Fox. The Parkin antibody that they put on the market, the Western blot looks like a railway track with one band different. Um, and so we told the companies in our micro little open consortium, Thermo made a recombinant single band on a gel goes away. So the fact that Again, the criterion was what's the quality bar, not will somebody fund it. There's three million antibodies. We need the new ones better be better than what's out there already. So yeah, they, they funded this and they recommend that antibody, the mm -hmm. railway track antibody, to all their researchers because uh, they paid for it and God damn it, it's good. But it was really not that good. So I think, again, I get back to the quality. And with CRISPR, it's possible now. It wasn't possible 10 years ago. So uh, we're under 10 minutes now, and so I'm going to ask each of you, uh, give you an opportunity for uh, any sort of closing remarks, anything that you want to emphasize from this afternoon's discussion. Megan, I'm going to ask you to start. Yeah, I think I would just emphasize sharing and being open with your tools. There's a lot of great research and a lot of great researchers out there that don't have access to things, so partnering with places like AdGene, which will try to get your tools used, I think is critical. And I also think it drives innovation. Our favorite topic is always CRISPR. You know, the, the early pioneers of CRISPR were faithful depositors. So you saw this loop where they deposit, people would use it, people would improve it and redeposit. And we would love if that happened for all of science, but especially for recombinant antibodies. And it really just drives innovation. 
Rob? All right, so I'm Dutch, and we, in Holland we say it's easy to preach for your own church uh, because everybody agrees, and I think that's what we heard today, a lot of frustration. Um, and so the one thing that IPI really is going to try and do is, of course, to make very good antibodies, but I think there will be a huge effort needed also to get the community that is not in this room at the moment and get their buy-in. So I think there's a big role for us to play there. Yeah. And I think this is the coolest thing you guys are doing. Uh, and uh, I just implore, please put quality reagents out there and that'll win the day in the end. Your reputation will go super sky high, I think. Yeah, I could, couldn't agree more. I think the, the quality is the, is the thing to, to shoot for. Um, and so uh, to, to, to really have this as, as the guiding principle. Having said this, I think there's a second component. If, if we look to something totally unrelated, uh, which is the music industry, where we have seen technology changes from the uh, first records to the long play records to the CDs to the, uh, to the streaming and download and so on and so forth, what has happened? Every time the quality has gotten better, it ha and, and, the, and it has gotten cheaper. And that's the reason why 100.0% of the population have shifted one, from one technology to the other. What we're proposing here is something that, uh, that I would say slightly increases the, um, the quality, but makes it perhaps more expensive than some of the stuff that's out there, and that's a hard sell. So in other words, I think a very, very important thing is to work on the problem of making this cheaper. I, I'll pick right up on that because it's about efficiency, Jake, on Andreas. And the, if we can run the same experiment for half the cost, the people in this room will just run two experiments. That makes you really weird, right? Because there's a lot of people in the world that would like take the half as profit and go do something else with it. But we're, we're populated in academia and in biotech with people who would just want to run the other experiment. So the more efficient we are at running these experiments, fantastic. So the more we collaborate, the more we're lowering the overall cost to get the data we need to, to run the next experiment. So I, I truly believe that we are 8 billion people on the face of the planet that are collaborating to defeat disease. Our competition is against disease, and I'm criticized for that, and people think that's idealistic and stupid. But I know everyone in this room actually thinks that. And it's like, you know, so how do we find that? You have to license what you have with the appropriate level of exclusivity so you can pay your bills. Right, you got to be sustainable, and so you got to charge for what you do. You got to charge a premium. I think you do have to charge a premium for your services and your reagents. Uh, to disrespectfully, to respectfully disagree with some of these things, we have to pay for our science, and the more efficient we are, we can lower the cost of what we're charging over time. But that is that is one of the trends in in, in technology is efficiency drives lower costs, and the only thing that I know of in the world that drives innovation and lower costs is competition, and we want competition around better drugs not competition among people here, among our companies. Let's just find a way to work together. And I think really, you know, all these comments today sort of sum up the same basic theme, which is that this is ultimately a community effort. And I think IPI has a big role to play in being a hub for a community around better antibodies, better reagent antibody um, discovery methods, validation methods, characterization data packages, and distribution with ad genes. So um, I think in the end, it's going to be how IPI works with the community that really makes this a successful initiative. God, way to bring that home. So, let me just, oh, I'm sorry, we have one more question. So, I don't think any conference or any panel discussion completes without talking about AI, machine learning, and deep learning. <laughs> so, so in, in that regard, I think Andreas talked about the technology. Um, is it possible to leverage this technology to speed up antibody discovery? Um, and, and then, how does this technology sort of facilitates um, the open source availability of antibodies. And any thoughts around that? I can comment on one aspect that we've been looking at in my lab academically, um, together with Debbie Marks, who's unfortunately not here today. And that's taking advantage of the fact that synthetic antibody discovery platforms generate really large quantities of often fairly high quality um, interaction data from the screening process. So you can do next gen sequencing on a library of millions or um, you know, even larger numbers of binders and use that information to train models on what sequence features confer polyreactivity or um, affinity and so forth. And so I, I don't think we're, you know, near the point yet where we're going to be able to dissolve, to design a sequence 
completely de novo reliably to have all the properties we want, but um, certainly we're generating data sets, and the IPI is probably going to be generating many of these data sets that can be used to train models to better predict which clones are going to be the, the winners in the end and the most well-behaved and so forth. I, I think it's all about efficiency. And yeah. so AI will help us and ML helps us be more efficient at designing and executing experiments. But at the end of the day, it's a human in the middle approach up until the point where you can just yeah. design drugs de novo, in which case we'll have cured everything within weeks and it's going to be great and we'll all get different jobs. I think it, it's, a, it's a component that will definitely enter basically all discovery processes, but will it have an effect on costs? I think only from that point on where it would actually replace wet lab experiments, and that I don't see for quite a while. Um, these days, I, I still, wet lab experiments are still needed to refine uh, things, and they will be still needed for quite a while to at least validate hypotheses that come from AI whether we live to see the day that the AI has gotten better than experiments, I wouldn't exclude that, but we're not there yet. Thank you. All right, so uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up uh, the panel. Please join me in thanking all of the panelists. I, I think this was a great discussion. Thank you very much.